Workers at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant have been battling problem after problem. They've been plugging leaks and scrambling to build storage tanks for contaminated water. Now they're about to begin work on a task that's taken years to prepare. They're ready to move the fuel rods from the damaged reactor buildings to a safer location. NHK World's Yoichi Tateiwa has more in today's Nuclear Watch. The media entered the Fukushima Daiichi on Wednesday to see the number four reactor building. The building contains more than 1,500 fuel units. Most of them have been used. They're extremely hot, highly radioactive, and experts say they need to be kept cool for 30 to 40 years. The rods are stored in a pool about 20 meters above ground. The water traps radiation and keeps the rods cool. But a hydrogen explosion in 2011 weakened the building structure. Experts say the rods must be moved to a safer place. Managers of Tokyo Electric Power Company have been preparing to start the job for the last two and a half years. They plan to lift the rods out with a crane, but the building was too weak to support it. The walkers built a steel frame. They will transfer the rods to containers that can seal in radiation. They will then move these to a starry facility within the compound and put them back into water. The job is far from straightforward. The walkers have to maneuver the rods under water to prevent any radiation from escaping and they will have to cope with high levels of radiation, up to 200 microsieverts per hour. The working environment here is more difficult and stressful than usual. Therefore, I want to devote every effort to safely transfer all the fuel rods. TEPCO officials say it will take more than a year to remove all the rods from reactor number four. Then. They will have to do it all over again at the three other reactors. They haven't said when they expect to finish. The operation is due to start this month. It's the latest huddle in the long process of decommissioning the plant, a project that's expected to take up to 40 years. Yoichiro Tateiwa, NHK World. Well, uh, what we're looking at right now, uh, Dean, makes all of that, all of that irrelevant. Everything's irrelevant in the face of Fukushima. In the face of Fukushima, it's all irrelevant. We're talking about billions of deaths potentially, and we're talking about untold suffering. Seriously. One worker, just for, just for fun, a worker at Fukushima, four months on the job, developed three major different, not metastasized, different cancers Jeez. just from being there. And what did he do? What did he do? He inhaled hot particles. Okay, and that's oh. what happens. Wow. goes into the digestive tract, into the bloodstream, it lodges wherever it sits. It ends up generating cancer. I would that's honestly, what's, that's um, what's all, all I, I, would, I mean, it sounds alarmist, but I would, I would get out off the West Coast. I just would, I no, would you know why? I'll tell you why. If you study, look at the currents. It uh, it doesn't actually hit the shore. It mm. it rebounds. It backs away from the shore. Yeah. But that's not the uh. point. The point is it will evaporate and go into the air, and the moisture, of course, will be directed by what? Well, by the jet stream. It'll take right. it all over the country. It'll go it up will. and over Seattle, over Vancouver. Yeah. It can go down. DC, can go down under San Diego, right through L.A. It can go anywhere. It can go, come down from Canada, all across the Midwest, right into your backyard, Dean. You, yeah. you know, it, there's nowhere to hide. Yeah, yeah. There's uh, nowhere to run. Bottle. Gene's out of bottle. It's the same with the GMO crops. Uh, you, you know, we can't put it back in. No, I this mean, is all, worse all than that, though. That doesn't damaged. matter anymore. Doesn't the Pacific matter. Ocean is dead. Mm -hmm. It's dead. No. You hear about the sailor, the mariner, no. the yachtsman? He he commonly makes a trip every few years from Osaka to San Francisco. He knows the ocean. He hasn't been since Fukushima. It was 800 days ago now. He made the trip 4,000 miles, 3,000 nautical miles from Osaka to San Francisco. He saw during the entire trip 
two fish, one bird, and one whale with an enormous tumor on it. That's all he saw during the whole trip. He said the ocean is broken. It's just, uh, and then it's, I heard there were, impo- uh, there were uh, did you hear about the thing where they were using like uh, these basically coercing people to be like slaves at this plant? Well, sure, machine. they bring them in there, they pay off their debts, and they're indentured servants. And they're going to start bringing in foreign workers pretty soon from, you yeah, know, Southeast Asia. Bangladesh. They'll bring them in. The yeah. Bangladeshis will come in, pay them 12 bucks a day, money they've never even seen before. And, and they'll, they'll grind them up and kill them off, and then they'll pay yep. in more. There's no way to fix it. No way to fix it. The head of Tokyo Electric Power Company says the utility is preparing a new report on the crisis at the crippled Fukushima plant. The announcement comes as the company tries to gain understanding to restart two other reactors in central Japan. TEPCO managers released their first report on the nuclear disaster in June last year. The evaluation was based on the company's own investigations, but many questions were left unanswered. So TEPCO president Naomi Hirose says the company is preparing another report. He told the lower house body that the new panel includes nuclear power experts from the United States and Britain and that the report will be released soon. A technical team in Niigata Prefecture is examining the safety features of the Kashiwazaki Kariwa plant where the utility hopes to restart two reactors. TEPCO management apparently decided a further probe into the nuclear accident in Fukushima was needed to gain the prefecture's approval. Hirose says a copy of the report will be given to Niigata officials for review. An executive of Japan's ruling party has suggested the government may not be able to achieve its decontamination goal for areas near the crippled Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant. He hinted that the government may need to review its target. Liberal Democratic Party Secretary General Shigeru Ishiba cited a report submitted last month by the International Atomic Energy Agency to the Japanese government. The report said the international standard for radiation exposure ranges between 1 and 20 millisieverts per year. The Japanese government has set a goal of 1 millisievert per year for areas surrounding the plant. The report says that target cannot be achieved quickly through decontamination efforts alone. It calls for government officials to make that clear to people living near the plant. Ishiba said the Japanese government should carefully analyze the team's recommendations and study decontamination standards in other countries. It's not desirable for people affected by the situation to be without the prospect or hope of change. He said the government and the LDP should hold a serious debate over how to improve the situation. The International Atomic Energy Agency is sending marine monitoring experts to Japan. They'll give advice on the problem of radioactive water leaking from the crippled Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant. The Global Nuclear Watchdog says two members of its Marine Environment Laboratory in Monaco will stay in Japan from Wednesday through next week. The experts will test samples of seawater and analyze them for radioactive materials. They'll also ask officials how they monitor the seawater. The IAEA plans to send another team of experts later this month. They'll also inspect the decommissioning process for the reactors. IAEA chief Yukiya Amano says Japan needs to cooperate with international organizations to deal with the problems at the Fukushima plant. He says this will help the country to regain the trust of the international community. Japanese officials are looking to set up future safeguards for nuclear power. They're getting help from Washington over a new risk assessment system. Japanese Deputy Foreign Minister Shinsuke Sugiyama met in Washington on Monday with U.S. Deputy Secretary of Energy Daniel Poneman. They were attending the second meeting of a nuclear safety commission. Officials from Japan and the U.S. set up the body last year following the accident at the Fukushima Daiichi plant. Japanese officials proposed using a U.S. model that computes the probabilities of a nuclear plant accident. The system quantifies factors like natural disasters, malfunctions, and human error to determine high-risk areas. Experts from both sides will put their heads together on how to implement the system in Japan.
That's the worst that could happen When you get out there and try You know your life Suddenly just end In the blink of an eye So what's the worst that could happen? try, you fail, you gotta gamble, you gotta take chances, oh, don't spend your whole life chasing that white whale, don't spend your whole life, what's the worst that could happen, what's the very, very worst, in order for the worst So you end up all alone Out on the street Sleeping on a mattress A complete unknown What's the worst that could happen? You feel sad a couple days You pick yourself up Bow your head and give thanks And then you're on your way And then you're on your way What's the worst that could happen? Was the very, very worst In order for the So, what's the worst that could happen when you get out there and try? You know your life could suddenly just end in the blink of an eye. In the blink of an eye. What's the worst that could happen when you get out there and try? try, you can fail, you gotta gamble, you gotta take chances, oh, don't spend your whole life chasing that white whale, don't spend your whole life. Global warming campaigners often focus on the production of carbon dioxide, but weather officials in Japan are looking at how the gas gets absorbed into the world's oceans. Japan Meteorological Agency personnel say there's 1.4 times as much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere as there was around 250 years ago. Scientists say levels are curbed by absorption of the gas into the sea. Agency analysts have collected water samples from around the world. They've been studying how much carbon dioxide gets soaked up. The experts posted the data online. They found areas like the northern Pacific and Atlantic in dark blue to absorb carbon dioxide. Waters close to the equator are red, meaning they release the gas. They say the world's seas absorb more carbon dioxide than they release. And they say annual oceanic absorption grew over the past two decades to reach 2 billion tons in 2011. 
that Japan's agriculture ministry may stop a subsidy program for, for rice farmers. The policy was implemented 40 years ago to stop rice prices from falling. Now, since the early 1970s, ministry officials have set annual rice production targets with quotas for producers. Each participating farm receives a subsidy. The officials are planning to end the rice production adjustment program by fiscal 2018. The policy has been criticized for inflating prices and rewarding a lack of innovation. The officials hope the change will help the industry brace for cheap imports through the Trans-Pacific Partnership Trade Pact. Well, people in developing nations need help dealing with climate change, help from people like the Japanese who are considering extending billions in financial aid. Ai Uchida joins us now from the business says, tell us, what's in it for the Japanese? Well, Catherine, they might be trying to offset international criticism for having to downgrade their own uh, carbon emissions uh, target that you just told us about, Catherine. So uh, the government officials here in Japan will announce a new plan at the upcoming UN conference to support developing countries fight global warming. They plan to commit to $16 billion worth of aid. The funds will go to Pacific Islands as well as Asian and African countries facing sea level rises and climate change. They'll be provided over three years through 2015. The plan is to counter storm surges as well as construct thermal power plants less harmful to the environment. Japanese officials will also announce the 2017 launch of a satellite to monitor greenhouse gases emitted by developing countries. And they'll discuss the implementation of eco-friendly technology by the 2030s. Developing countries are expected to seek $35 billion worth of aid at the conference. Japan's proposal covers about 40% of that amount. Japanese leaders have struggled to satisfy the country's energy needs ever since the accident at Fukushima Daiichi. The nuclear crisis led them to shut down reactors across Japan one by one. They say because of that, they have to revise their targets for reducing greenhouse gases. The officials set a base year of 2005. They say by 2020, they hope to reduce emissions over those levels by 3.8 percent. Government leaders are expected to approve the change next week, and Japanese delegates will submit the target at a United Nations conference on climate change in Warsaw, Poland. Four years ago, Japanese promised to slash emissions by one quarter over 1990 levels. The new target is about 3 percent higher. Cases of mislabeled food are appearing one after uh, the other at hotel restaurants in Japan. Now long established department stores are also involved. We sincerely apologize to customers for causing this trouble. We are very sorry. Takashimaya said restaurants and grocery sections at five of its branches and a shopping center were involved in false labeling. The company reported 62 cases. They include using cheaper shrimp not stated on menus and serving processed meat injected with beef fat as steak. The company also said the term fresh was used on packaged juice. Daimaru Matsuzakaya, with a more than 400-year history, also announced mislabeling. Theirs involved traditional New Year's food sold at the end of 2012. Japanese fishermen have started hauling in one of winter's prize catches, snow crabs. Crabs are a seasonal delicacy showing up in everything from sushi to hot pot soups. The Sea of Japan is a key hunting ground. The crews of these boats are trawling 40 kilometers off the coast of Fukui Prefecture. They put down their nets at the stroke of midnight. Not long after, they were pulling in the first catch of the season. Some of the shells measured 20 centimeters across. I'm glad to see these crabs. We will work hard. The first auction takes place later on Wednesday. If the season goes well, the boats will be hauling in snow crabs until late March. 
With its sweet, delicate flesh, Japan's spiny lobster known as Isebe is a prized gourmet delicacy. But recently there's been trouble in some of the lobster's home grounds. Fishermen in Nagasaki Prefecture, southwest Japan, are alarmed at falling catches. Experts say rising water temperatures and an altered ecosystem are the cause, and they're looking for a fix. This little creature is a spiny lobster larva called Puerilus. It's about two centimeters long and has a distinctive transparent body. The number of puerilus in the ocean is falling. This means, of course, less lobster. The fisheries agency says last year's catch in Nagasaki hit an all-time low. Over the past 50 years, the number of lobsters caught has fallen by 80 percent. The Nomozaki Sea is one of Nagasaki's most fertile spiny lobster grounds. For 16 years, researchers from the local Fisheries Institute have been conducting an underwater survey. Ten years ago, they set these concrete blocks on the sea floor. The blocks help them study the lobster's habitat. This is rare footage of the lava in its transparent form. After five days, the lava sheds its clear shell and turns red. Here is a baby spiny lobster. It's about three centimeters long and almost identical to its fully grown self. The researchers drilled each of the blocks with holes of various sizes. The lobsters move around and find the holes they like as they shed their shells and grow. But despite this cozy sort of apartment building, the number of lobsters per block this year have fallen to one-third their peak of about 70. To investigate, the researchers looked into the lobster's life cycle. This picture was taken three years ago. It shows one of the concrete blocks covered with a tall variety of seaweed called Sargassum macrocarpum. The larvae are born close to land. After drifting in the open seas for nearly a year, they return as puerilus. They descend to the ocean floor by grabbing onto seaweed. They mature as they feed on the creatures that live there. The seaweed is essential for the spiny lobster to form colonies. But now conditions have changed. Last autumn, ocean temperatures rose and the fish that eat the seaweed were active for longer. Researchers say the resource was depleted all across Nagasaki. The problem is that the seaweed is disappearing and it is having difficulty recovering it to its original state. In an effort to restore the environment, Workers for Nagasaki Prefecture have planted seaweed in 400 concrete blocks which they will install on the seafloor. The blocks will be enclosed by nets. Researchers believe the nets will protect the seaweed enough for it to replenish itself. Local fishermen hope this will lure back the puerilus to the traditional lobster grounds. By nurturing seaweed, we want to create an environment where spiny lobsters can thrive. Many people hope this simple measure for the environment will bring back spiny lobster numbers to their earlier heights of plenty. Officials from six global powers are to kick off a two-day meeting with Iran over its nuclear program. Leaders in Tehran are hoping their new proposals will ease international concerns. The Iranians will meet with delegates from the U.S., Russia, China, Britain, France and Germany in Geneva. EU Foreign Policy Chief Catherine Ashton is chairing the talks. Foreign Minister Mohammad Javad Zarif is leading the Iranian delegation. The Iranians made concessions at the last meeting in October. They agreed on ways to deal with enriched uranium that has weapons potential. On Sunday, Iran's Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei threw his weight behind the talks. These negotiators are on a difficult mission and they're giving their utmost effort to it. Hamane has the final say on the nuclear program. Leaders in Tehran are hoping for an agreement within a year. Envoys to the six-party talks on North Korea's nuclear program have been engaged in a series of meetings. They're looking at the possibility of restarting the negotiations. China's envoy Wu Dawei arrived in Pyongyang on Monday to meet with North Korean leaders. He visited Washington last week with a proposal for restarting the talks. 
U.S. Representative Blaine Davis discussed the proposal with his South Korean counterpart, Cho Taeyeon. In all about four hours of uh, discussions, uh, very wide range, and talked about all aspects of the uh, North Korea issue, and we will come back uh, to the table tomorrow. Davis and Chao plan to sit down with a senior Japanese official on Wednesday. Junichi Ihara is chief of the Foreign Ministry's Asian Affairs Bureau. Negotiators to the six-party talks last met nearly five years ago. North Korean officials want to resume the talks without preconditions. China chairs the forum and its leaders back the North's position. But officials in the U.S., South Korea and Japan want to see concrete action first. They're calling on leaders in Pyongyang to make progress on denuclearization.